So our next speaker is Josh Holt from University of British Columbia, Canada. Um, first, I'll apologize because in the schedule I have a title to do a superconductivity, which is not what Josh is talking about. <laughs> in any case, uh, uh, Josh is uh, well. He's well over many different things, but he uh, particularly worked on two D systems. Um, and more recently, uh, very interesting aspects of thermodynamics and systems. So, that's my point. so thanks very much. Thank you, Jimmy. And I'm sorry to those of you who are eagerly anticipating this kind of talk. Um, uh, so instead, I'm going to talk about thermodynamics. Um, and those of you who are already professors know, and that most of your students, so probably you know that uh, when you become a professor, very often you end up teaching something that you're not an expert in. So I'm going to take advantage of that freedom today and tell you about something that I'm only a little bit of an expert in. Uh, so hopefully it'll uh, hopefully you'll learn something in the next hour. So again, uh, the, the overview of this talk is thermodynamic measurements in 2D systems. And maybe I can broaden it a little bit to say low dimensional systems. We'll talk about 0D and 2D. Um, let me first introduce our group a little bit. Uh, so we're, uh, we're at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And uh, historically, our group has always been interested in First of all, historically, we've been a trend worker. So, conductance measurements, resistance measurements in quantum devices, meaning you know, electronic devices that are cold enough that their behavior is quantum mechanical in some way. And, and specifically, we've especially been interested in uh, quantum effects associated with spin. Um, so, this is a picture from about a decade and a half ago. Uh, we found that if you measure quantum interference in graphene, so this was in the early days of graphene, if you measure electrical transport, then that transport is modulated by quantum interference, which is the positive electrons can take as they move through the material. And so you see these sort of uh, random changes in conductance as you vary just about any parameter. This one happens to be gate voltage. This is magnetic field, and uh, a surprise uh, to, to us and, and everybody at that point was that uh, you could actually see the splitting of each of these what would otherwise be random features following the same energy of this point. So this was this is just a sort of picture to give you a sense for the, the ancient history of our group. I'm really interested in, in quantum transport and specifically in spin. And then more recently, over the last decade or so, my group is split in the or two branches. Um, one branch is really focused on 2D materials. So this is a picture from, from one of our, our recent papers looking at twisted double bilayer graphene. So two bilayers of graphene on top of each other with a twist between them. We look, we look at some other 2D materials as well. That we're excited about right now. For now, we're focusing on transport measurements. So standard connectivity you know, resistivity measurements in these. But then a second side of my group, uh, or a second branch in a group, is has started uh, figuring out how to do thermodynamic measurements, and specifically, we're interested in entropy in the smallest possible quantum systems. Make it. So those right now we make in gallium arsenide. This is a picture of a quantum dot in this guy here in gallium arsenide. Uh, you refer to these 
the structure that you make, like you start from a quantum dot and then you build other circuit components, is called mesoscopic circuits. Mesoscopic means somewhere in between the really quantum length scales, where you're just dealing with a wave function of one electrons, and bigger length scales where you can connect it up to a so, so my group specializes in entropy measurements in mesoscopic circuits and in 2D materials. But today I'm going to give you a, a talk, a lecture about thermodynamics in 2D materials. It's not something we exactly do. We sort of do thermodynamics when we do 2D materials, but right now we don't do them together. But I hope you'll uh, you'll learn something interesting first of all about the challenge of doing measurements like this and how to solve some of those challenges. And second of all, why it's really important and really powerful for the technique. Okay, so as an outline for the talk, I'm going to start by just you know, reminding everyone sort of what I mean when I talk about thermodynamics and specifically about entropy. Um, then the standard way of measuring entropy in you know a bulk crystal like like Julia might make is uh, is you do calorimetry. And uh, it turns out that calorimetry in 2D is extremely hard. So I'll show you an example of someone who's done a really beautiful but extremely difficult measurement of calorimetry in uh, graphene. Um, but then perhaps motivated by the challenge of that experiment, I'll show you a more powerful way of measuring Entropy in this case, but you could measure other thermodynamic quantities using Maxwell relation. Uh, so I'll show you an experiment from our group in zero D. So that's in a quantum dot, so just a single electron. And then I'll show you a measurement from a different group in 2D for magic angle with some body Okay, and I would ask you please uh, to interrupt me if you have questions. I, I heard there were a lot of Great questions for Julia's talk that you waited uh, till the end for. Uh, I would love it if you would introduce me as, uh, sorry, not introduce, interrupt me uh, as I'm as I'm going through because it really helps me as well. So thank you. You'll be doing everyone a favor if you. Good. So first of all, uh, what do I mean when I talk about thermodynamic measurements? I'm sure you know from your. So in every class in undergrad or top grad school, uh, you've encountered all of these quantities. They're usually called state variables that describe the thermodynamic state of the system. Maybe some of you use them in your research all the time. Uh, if you're from a transport group like me, right, this would be SDM, you probably don't think about all these quantities all the time. But when I talk about thermodynamic measurements, I mean measuring things like entropy or magnetization. I'm going to focus on entropy in this talk. I do not mean things that you might think of as thermodynamic, but I also associate with transport. So, for example, thermal conductance. That's not what I'm talking about today, or thermal power. These are really about how heat moves through a system. And as a result, it combines both thermodynamics and scattering, details of scattering in the system. That makes things more complicated. And so I don't want to worry about this for now. So really what I'm talking about is just the ground state, state variables of a quantum system, and specifically will focus on entropy. But everything I say today, you know, besides the fact that you can measure it with calorimetry, everything else would apply just as well in magnetization or most other thermodynamic variables. Okay, so. Uh, for those of us who don't think about entropy all the time, um, if I would ask many of you, what is entropy? What is it telling you? Some of you might have in your head that it is really a measure of disorder, because that's very often uh, how we encounter it, especially in, in undergrad classes. Um, that's partly true, but it's only because there are many more ways of making a disordered system than an ordered system. Entropy is really about counting. It's just about asking how many ways there are to, to arrange a system. 
it's not explicitly telling you about this order, it's really telling you about counting. And so perhaps you're interested in disorder. So, so maybe that's what you want to learn from energy measurement. But often in quantum systems, maybe the system is very perfect. You're not really interested in disorder in the system. You're really interested in counting what are the degeneracies in the system? How many ways can the system arrange itself, not because of disorder, but just because of degenerate degrees of freedom? And those are perhaps the things you're really interested in measuring. For my talk, uh, this is really the aspect that I'm interested in. So it really will be an exercise in counting. So you probably remember entropy is a B times the log of this big omega in this case means multiplicity. So it's just the log of the number of ways the system can arrange itself. So if we can measure entropy, we can count the number of ways the system can arrange itself. And very often we can learn something important about this. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to lead you all on a brief history of solid state physics. Probably you, uh, some of you remember this from when you learned it at some point, but uh, let, let, let me start from the beginning. So it, it started about, I guess, two centuries ago when these French fellows. Uh, realized a surprising fact that uh, the molar heat capacity of all solids is about the same. And it happens to be this number three R. So, with experimental observations, there wasn't at the beginning any particularly good explanation for it, but it was really a surprise. All solids, no matter how different they are in their other properties, they all have this same uh, molar heat. At least at room temperature is what they were allowed to see that. Okay, so then about a hundred, well, almost a hundred years later, Boltzmann figured out that you can explain this 3R by thinking of all of the atoms in the solid as being independent harmonic oscillators. And so he, he went through this calculation that showed that. You can explain the heat capacity by thinking, by, by really imagining a solid as just a collection of independent homologous. So that was really the beginning of people understanding at a microscopic point of view, what is a solid. And it really came from this surprising observation about heat capacity, which is really also about entropy. Okay. So then uh, another 20 years later, or 10 years later, um, experiments were demonstrating that uh, as you go to a lower temperature, then this C equals 3R no longer holds. And so now looking at heat capacity or entropy, we started by getting a micro microscopic description of, of solids, at least at a classical level, and then Einstein figured out, or he and a few others figured out around the same time, that you could explain this low temperature deviation by quantized energy levels. So this was in a way also one of the one of the first ingredients in the discovery of quantum mechanics, the quantization of these harmonic oscillator states. And some level also comes from the capacity measure. Then Looking more into the details of solid state, a divide figured out that if you treat these harmonic oscillators of different atoms, you know, not as independent harmonic oscillators, but interacting, then you get these sort of large scale oscillations, phonons we now call them, and that gives you this uh, T, C is proportional to T to the third dependence that was, uh, that was discovered. Okay, and so I'm not going to be talking about any of these specific aspects of entropy. But what I wanted to try to convey to those of you who don't think about entropy all the time is that studying this quantity, which is really just a matter of, which is really just a metric for counting the way a system can organize itself, can be extremely powerful. It was really sort of the driver of solid state physics at the beginning. And it all came from measuring Entropy and doing that by measuring. 
how do you do that, or at least how did people do that at the beginning? Well, we have these relations from thermodynamics. Entropy is related to heat, and heat capacity, of course, is related to heat and temperature. So when you combine these two, then you, then you get the entropy, and or specifically entropy change between two temperatures can be measured or can be extracted by measuring the heat capacity as a function of temperature and integrating it. Okay, so this was the standard approach, or is maybe the standard approach for measuring entropy in bulk systems, systems where you can supply some heat and measure some temperature. So, you know, a crystal you can hold in your hand, you can put it in a perimeter, and you can use this approach to measure entropy. Yeah. So, uh, considering the definition of counting, uh, one can basically when you are counting, you are counting relevance between periods. Yes. How do you consider which are relevant? So, uh, you you use the word relevant. I would maybe change that word to be accessible. So uh, basically, the, the number of degrees of freedom a system can access, which involves energy considerations, it might involve um, time scale considerations. So there, there's lots of aspects that go into that. But yeah, you're right. It, it's about counting the number of accessible states for a system. Okay. So uh, again, getting back to this idea of, of counting, uh, this is a way of measuring not this order, but I would say order, because depending on the specific type of order, there will be different ways, a uh, different, sorry, number of ways that the system can rank itself with that type of order. And really it's about degeneracies because you're looking at accessible states. So if different states are degenerate, and at low temperature, they will all be accessible. If their space are part of energy, then you can't access them. So a nice example, I think, of, of, sort of the, the, the power of entropy measurements was uh, dealing with these materials that are known as spin ices. So it was discovered a long time ago that water ice has a very interesting heat capacity, it has a large heat capacity, unusual, different than, than most other solids. And it was discovered that the, that where this comes from is if you try to draw out a crystal arrangement involving a bunch of water molecules. So here, the red is the oxygen in water, the two whites are hydrogens. So you can imagine each water molecule is sort of like my, fingers with the oxygen here and the two hydrogens here. And so if you're trying to take a bunch of objects that are sort of V-shaped like this and, and assemble them together into these, uh, into these, I don't know what they're called, uh, hexagonal shapes, 3D hexagonal shapes, then you can't do it in a simple way. There's a frustration involved with how you connect these different angular shapes. And that frustration leads to a large number of, de of degenerate or nearly degenerate ground states. So there's many different ways that these, that these angles can arrange themselves in structures, and they're all the same or very close in energy. And so that gives you this anomalously large heat capacity who figured it out at the beginning that it's this uh, log two minus half of log three over two. And you get you, when you go through this frustration, this is the number that you get. And so an interesting discovery was made about 20 years ago, which is that if you take these magnetic material with skins at the corners of these tetrahedrons, then there's a similar frustration, actually mathematically identical frustration that comes about that then gives you 
this the same entropy. So although this the entropy of water ice comes from you know an arrangement of H2Os, you get exactly the same heat capacity, the same entropy if you're dealing with an arrangement of spins that have the same frustration. And so these heat capacity measurements are really important in understanding what is this frustration in the skin ice. Okay, so it's just another example of how entropy measurements can tell you use, tell you something very useful and very interesting about the quantum mechanical low energy, low energy states in complicated solid materials. Yeah. Why is there a difference between zero and the half Tesla? So the half, so this is for spin ice, first of all, it's not for water. Right. And I believe that the difference comes from the fact that uh, so you have the frustration with no well-defined axis at zero field. When you uh, when you turn on a magnetic field, then I believe you you sort of change this frustration, so you define a particular axis. And though I'm not an expert in this material, I guess that this turns the, the skins from being sort of locked into a state at low energy to being free. That's my understanding. Okay, but I want to I want to now uh, change directions, and I want to talk about how to measure entropies in uh, low dimensions. So not a crystal. Thing. So we have this technique for measuring entropies, which is you measure heat capacities as a function of temperature and you integrate them up. But there's a problem, or there's several problems, if you're trying to measure the heat capacity of a low dimensional system. And it comes from the fact that if you don't have that third dimension to sort of you know, stack millions or billions of atomic layers on top of each other, then the entropies and heat capacities are very tiny. It makes it a very hard, very, very tiny quantity to try to measure. So for example, if you're trying to measure the temperature, you need a way of measuring temperature that won't disturb the temperature of the system. If you try to use some external thermometer, that thermometer has got to be also tiny, or else the thermometer itself is going to affect the system. Or you can try to use the sample itself as a thermometer that comes with its own charge. Anyway, so this is one of the hard parts. A bigger challenge is that heat flow from any object, if you have any, any object in our real 3D space, heat flows in all three dimensions. And that, that is, as a result, heat flow from any object scales within the surface area, but the capacity scales with volume, a 2D object is all surface. So basically, the ratio of heat flow out the heat capacity becomes extremely large. And as a result, if you think about, if you think about sort of the electric circuit version of a heat capacity measurement, where the heat capacity is like a capacitance to, you know, to add heat, and then the heat flow out is like a resistance, the RC time becomes extremely short in any 2D material. And as a result, you have to perform calorimetry extremely quickly. So depending on the details, microseconds would be the longest this could possibly take. And often it's not it's very hard to measure temperature that quickly. So this is, a, this is another very serious topic. Okay, so in the end, uh, I'm gonna show you a way to measure entropy that doesn't require this basically this measurement of heat capacity. But for now, I want to show you a very beautiful experiment that managed to do this despite these difficulties. So this was a benchman from the Epitoff group. And they measured, they were, their goal was to measure the electronic heat capacity. So that means the heat capacity of the electrons, not the phonons, for example, in graphene. And so here you can see just a schematic experiment to basically see what's going to happen. Uh, the electronic circuit down here is basically a way of doing a, a, 
doing a noise measurement, basically. They're looking at the jumps of noise created by this graphene at finite chemistry. And so this happens to be a technical measurement, but basically that's only because they're trying to measure high frequency noise. The measurement itself is a relatively slow measurement, let's say. Let's call it a DC measurement of the noise. Okay, so this is a, a noise measurement, measure temperature. Their heater is a laser. And so you'll see sort of soon where this is coming. They use two lasers, which have a beating between them, so they can turn this heating on and off very quickly. And then this is the sort of electronic model that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, you can think about you're dumping heat into the graphene. It has some heat capacity, like a capacitance. And then there's some thermal resistance to that. But so by looking at these RC times, they can measure this capacitivity. And so the result of this is that they were able to measure heat capacities. So these are you know, looking at different scales from, from, different, from different materials. And over the decades, they were able to push the specific heat measurements down to around 1,000 kV. So kV is sort of the, the fundamental unit of heat capacity. And so if you're looking at single spins, for example, they'll have a heat capacity for this kV. So, you know, this is not one, but it's also not 10 to the 18. So they were able to, to they were able to get reasonably close to this fundamental. So how did they do it? Okay, so if you read the formula, let me just go through one by one. So this first one is a uh, is two different lasers. One of them is a fixed wavelength, the second one in two its wavelength. So then the beating between these laser lasers means that the optical train will be pulsating in its power. So this fast sine wave you see here, that's the optical frequency. And then this beating, that's from the difference between these two laser wavelengths. And so this beating pattern gets a sheet of graphene. And then connected to that graphene are two leads, which are connected to this circuit that are used to measure the high frequency Johnson noise. But the measurement of the power of that Johnson noise, which is gives you temperature, is a slow measurement, so a time scale of seconds. Okay, so this is a slow measurement of the Johnson noise in this graphene that result from pinning it with extremely fast beating pattern between two lasers. So this is kind of the model that they use to extract, extract the heat capacity. But I'll be go, I'll go into that in the next. Okay. So how do we understand this? Basically, you can think about this graphene, which is absorbing a power in and then depending on its temperature, releasing some power into a thermal bath, you can think about this as a thermal low-pass filter. So why is that relevant? Well, if we look at this beating pattern from the two lasers, basically you, you're effectively turning a laser on and off and on and off and on and off really fast, okay? Time scale of terahertz frequency scale of terahertz to turn the laser on and off. So that's the, the rate at which these, these beat patterns are hitting the graphene. But of course, if you take a power which is you know, zero at these points or positive at these points, the power is never negative. So you can express this power, this power from the beating laser, as an average part plus an oscillatory part. Okay, so this beating pattern gives you an, an average DC power plus an oscillatory power at the beating frequency. Any questions about this? Okay, so this 
power is hitting a sheet of graphene. And now we've talked about this, but let me be more explicit about what I mean by a thermal low path filter. So you can think about this power coming in, energy is conserved, charge is also conserved. So you can think about power coming in like a current coming into an RC circuit. Okay, and so we have a DC current and a you know finite frequency current, and that's going into an object that has a heat capacity, so that's like a capacitor. And there's a thermal resistance to ground, so that's like a resistor down here. And okay, so how is this electric circuit going to behave? Well, at low frequency, the capacitor is in, is insulated. Its resistance is infinite, right? So at low frequency, all of this uh, all of this current has to go to the resistor. At high frequency, this current is shorted through the capacitor. Okay, and so this circuit here and this guy here lets high frequency through but keeps the DC. And from the cutoff frequency of a, of a circuit like this, you can, if you know R, you can measure C. So that's the basic idea. Okay. And so if you look at the electron temperature in this graphene, in the presence both of a DC power and an oscillatory power, and your electron temperature for different frequencies will look something like this. So these are four different frequencies. This is a slow frequency, blue is a fast frequency. And so because only the because only the low paths, uh, sorry, only the low frequencies are not short circuited by this capacitor. If you're at very high frequency, the oscillations will be very small, but at low frequency, the oscillations will be large. And so measuring basically the crossover between green and blue is what allows you to measure this thermal panel. Any questions? Yeah. So the question is, how, do this, how does the substrate affect the entropy? So is that, is that the question? OK, so um, first of all, the temperature that you're measuring is the temperature of the electrons, because it's a Johnson noise measurement. And as a result, the heat capacity that you're measuring is that of the electrons. You, may, you assume that everything else in the circuit is the, like the substrate and the contacts and everything like that is the thermal back. And so, although they themselves will have some entropy, you're assuming that you're, you're looking at, you're looking at the excess heating of the electrons compared to the surroundings. And so what you're going to see is just the energy from the electrons. Okay. Okay, so, the problem is you have this temperature that's oscillating really fast. This time scale of picoseconds, so this is oscillating at hundreds of gigahertz. You can't measure temperature that fast, so you could never see these oscillations. So the, so the really beautiful trick that they use is they're basically not, they're not measuring the time scale of the oscillations, they're just measuring the amplitude of the oscillations. And the way they can do that is that the thermal relaxation is not linear, where the, the thermal conductance is not linear. So if you look at how much the temperature rises for a given power in, it's a sublinear function. As the electrons get hotter and hotter, they lose heat faster and faster. So, at, so when you're at the top of this sine wave, you'll lose heat quickly. When you're at the bottom of the sine wave, you'll lose heat more slowly. And so if you look at the averages, between blue, orange, and green, even though the averages look like they're the same, they're not quite the same. So they're looking at the difference in the average. And for that, they're measuring basically the size of these oscillations. Okay, 
So they measure this average temperature as a function of the beating frequency. And from this crossover point in that average temperature, they can measure the RC time effectively. And from that, they can measure C, the heat capacity. And from that, uh, well, yeah, so from that, they can get entropy, but in the, here they're just. And so they do this measurement of heat capacity for graphene. This is the Dirac point. This is the theory. And this is the experimental data. You can see it's pretty good. Um, it's a fantastically hard measurement. And it's great that they're able to get down to a few hundred AD of error bar. But that's still not good enough if you want to measure quantum states where really the entropy is just a few times KD, especially if you have to do it at low temperatures. You can't do this business with the layers. Okay, so let me let me suggest a more sensitive technique for measuring high entropy. So this is the one we talked about. This is basically calorimetry. So uh, just so you don't feel like you're really in a lecture, I'm not going to go through this line by line. But if you start with these thermodynamic identity, it's supposed to be identities. You have internal energy, you have free energy, you have all these different potentials. Some of you will remember you can take different particle derivatives in combination with each other, equate them with each other. And what you get in the end is that there are well defined relationships between various differentials that you find here. Okay? And so you can derive these depending on all the various different identities you start with. These are just two of the Maxwell relations. That's what, that's what it's called when you get these relations between the differentials. So these two are the ones that are going to be relevant for today. Uh, if you, you can find that how entropy changes with particle number, so this is the entropy per particle, or how entropy changes with chemical potential. These are equal to two things that are relatively easy to measure electronically. The first is chemical potential. It's like a voltage, and so it's almost as easy to measure as a voltage. And n particle number, we're very good at measuring charges, even at the way sub-single electron level. And so we can measure both of these quantities very sensitively. We can control the temperature very sensitively. And so from that, we can get these two parameters. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you two different ways of using these Maxwell relations to read out entropy. And these are techniques that work much better in low dimensional systems where you don't have much Okay, any questions? Yes. Going back to that, so just for clarification, when you're saying you measure charge points, so you're not well, that's first of all, but the people who are doing yeah, that, yeah. So, so, so in that experiment, you're to be clear, so you're they are measuring the temperature change. So I'm guessing they're measuring uh, technically the change in Johnson noise. So they're measuring, so first of all, they're measuring. A Johnson noise itself, and they have a way of calibrating their instruments so they can so they can figure out how much Johnson noise is coming from the samples, which which will be a change you know compared to the amplifiers, let's say. Um, and and then yes, they're looking at how the Johnson noise changes when they apply this laser. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I want to talk about two different kind of measurements of following this maximum relation approach. So this is one from our group. It's not really in a 2D material. Uh, it's in it's starting from a two-dimensional electron gas. This gray background that you see here is a 2D electron gas in gas arsenide. These lighter colors here are metal gates you can put on top. And then by applying voltages to these, we can make a quantum dot where we can trap a few electrons. We have a reservoir that we can use for thermodynamics. And we have here a constriction we can use as a dual heater. We drive current through and get some power. So this is an experiment that's carried out by uh, my existing entropy team at UBC, uh, former 
uh, students and postdocs, and the people who grew the two dimensional electron gases in Purdue. So, first of all, for those of you who have not uh, heard talks about quantum dots before, let me just again explain basically what's happening. Again, the background is a 2D sheet of electrons. It could, in principle, be graphene, especially if there were a bad gap, but in this case, it's not. It's galvanized. The light color here are metal gates. You apply negative voltages to all of those gates. Actually, not to VD. You keep this one about grounded. So imagine pushing electrons away from everywhere there's gold here, except this one. So you can trap electrons in this little circle, and you can actually control that number so it's either zero, one, two, or three. You can control it down to the sound of zero electrons in that dot. So you can think about this as, as discrete energy, as this dot is having discrete energy levels separated by a coulomb charging energy. And so depending on where you set those levels as compared to the Fermi energy in a reservoir, this is a reservoir out here, then, uh, then you can control the number of electrons in that. Okay, so uh, remember we need to measure mu or n to get entropy. So in this case, we're measuring n. So for that, I use this constriction that runs near the side. Okay, and so this is a, a charge sensor. Basically, electrons are trying to get from here to here. There's this constriction, and depending on how many electrons are here, the potential at this saddle point will be higher or lower. And so this is the current. This here is the current in that constriction as I add the first electron to the quantum dot. So you can see that it drops from 7.6 nanoamps down to about, I don't know, 6.7 or so nanoamps as the first electron is added. Okay, so what that's telling you is that this current provides a readout of the number of electrons in this quantum dot, or the fractional number of electrons in it. Okay, so that means. Changes in that current can tell me about changes in the electron. And that was the first ingredient I need for that box Okay, so you notice, for example, that this step, this charge step here, is broadened a little bit. It's broadened because you're at finite temperature. And so, specifically for the Maxwell relation, you need to measure dn dt. All right, so we're looking at how changes in this current are driven by changes in temperature. We have a dual heater for this device that can heat this sort of pinkish reservoir. And so we're looking for how the current changes at different temperatures. You can see here in dashed, that's 100 millikelvin. In red, that's 130 millikelvin. So already here from the bare data, you can see that there is a change in N due to temperature. And this is the this is what we're using dnt, and we'll be integrating up over mu, which is basically gate voltage. Okay, so this is that charge condition you saw before. This is so this is something like n, and then the difference between the hot and cold traces is dn, or in this case a dt of thirty millivolts. Okay, so the difference between the blue and the red looks like this. Okay, so this curve here is directly proportional to dn dt. We have to figure out the constant proportionality, which we can do, and then we can integrate this up and we can get the answer. So what does that look like for the first electron? Well, if you have no electrons in the dot, the energy is zero. When you have one full electron in the quantum dot, the entropy is log two. Where is that log two coming from? Well, the electron in the quantum dot can either be spin up or it can be spin down. So I can count states, that's two. So the entropy is KB log two. How about this little peak in the middle? It's at log three, right in the middle of that chart pinch. What is that? How are you getting an entropy of log three for this electron that's sort of halfway in the dot? Well, again, you can count states. 
There's three different things that the electron can be. It can be up in the dot, it can be down in the dot, or it can be not in the dot. Okay, and so you can count the states here. You have three possible states, it be log three. Okay, so these are rather trivial entities. There's no surprise to these log threes and log twos, but this gives you a sense of the kind of error bars we have. Notice this is fractions of a KB. This is log two. We can measure this log two within a few percent. So these macro relations give you a very high precision. Yeah, just so I understand the delta S curve. Uh, so that's the integrated delta I on the curve of the plot above. With, um, with the conversion. So, so delta I is proportional to dn. It's not dn itself. So we have to convert I to n. But then once you do but that, that it's, it's, it's a constant. Yes. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand the shape. So but yeah, the shape comes from integrating this curve. And then there's a pre factor that it. Okay, so now in my last five minutes or so, I, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I do have a question about the proportionality. So, so you, you, your uh, current is proportional to your occupancy. Yeah. Um, is that giving you an entropy or is that calibrated based already on your knowledge that it has to be low? No, that is calibrated based on the fact that we are sure that what's entering the dot from this point to that point is one electron. Okay, so your entropy is completely independent. And it is independent, yes. Okay, so now let's go from 0D to 2D. Remember, the ingredients for this macro relation are you need to be able to measure D mu or Dn. You need to be able to change the temperature. And in general, if you want to be sensitive, you should be able to change the temperature fast so you can get away from one of your efforts. So there were two beautiful examples of this technique for measuring entropy in magic angle graphing. These were from, uh, from two different groups that appeared back to back uh, about two years ago uh, in nature. Uh, so I'm gonna talk mostly about this first, but they, they had very similar results and very similar techniques. Okay, so for the last eight minutes or so, I've been using the other Maxwell relation, the one that was DSD mu is DNDT. For this experiment, I'm going to use the other Maxwell relation, DSDN is T. I wonder if I said it wrong. Anyway, DSDN is mu. All right, so this is what we'll use. So that means we need to be able to measure mu and change T. So they do that and do this in two different ways. One is a global way, they use a sheet of monolayer graphene to sense the chemical potential of magic angle graphene. In the other case, they use a single electron transistor, basically a little quantum dot, to sense the chemical potential of magic angle graphene. Okay, so I was going to spend a few minutes talking about how to measure chemical potential. I don't really have time, so I just want to go very quickly over the basic idea. If you have two different materials with two different chemical potentials. And you connect them by, you know, with a wire, with some battery, with a voltage. And you have all different kind of potentials that are involved. First of all, the potential energy to take an electron from down here to up here is set by that voltage. But that's broken up into an electrostatic part and the chemical part. The chemical part, it's not really chemistry here, this is coming from thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. And then this electrostatic part is really coming from charges. And so if you think about this thing as a capacitor plate, the thing that matters is the electrostatic part. What we're interested in entropy, interested in for entropy is the, is the chemical part. And what we know from this battery is the total of both of those parts. So we have this relationship between the electrostatic potential, phi, the chemical potential, mu, and V. V is the sum of these two. And so by playing different games, holding V constant, holding Q of the capacitor plane constant, so Q will depend on the electrostatic capacitor as an electrostatic object. 
All it cares about is the arrangement of charges. It doesn't care about the, the chemical interest. So you can look at charges, which tell you five. You can look at voltages. And then by holding one or the other of those things constant, you can use either voltage or charge to read out. Okay, and so in this case, they hold the monolayer graph loop at exactly zero density. So at zero density, the chemical potential will be zero. You can think about the chemical potential, or oh, these two are at effectively the same voltage. This is just a tiny little voltage to measure the conductance of this guy. So these are basically, V is basically zero between these, but the, but the monolayer graph will tend to charge up from the chemical potential on this. And so you have to decharge it by the top gate if you want to hold it at exactly zero density. Okay, so they do a transport right there to this guy, hold it at the Dirac point, that zero density, and then they can use out what voltage do they have to apply here to cancel out the chemical potential from this guy. And so that's one way of reading the potential. Another way is to use, to, to imagine that this chemical potential or, or this magic chemical graphene will act as a gate on the SET. Again, it's acting as a gate only by the electrostatic part. And so if you, again, hold this and this at the same voltage, this is a very tiny voltage here, then you can read out the chemical potential by its effect on the transport through this SET. Because the voltages are held to be the same. If the chemical potential changes, the electrostatic potential must change to cancel it out. And so these two approaches, global and local, allow you to read out the chemical potential by basically what is the gating effect of this magic angle graphene on either the SET or the monomer graph. And so by mapping out this chemical potential as a function of the density in the magic angle and the temperature, you can calculate mu as a function of N and T. That means that any particular value of N, you can extract the entropy by this integrated Maxwell relation. So you have ds to n is the mu dt, so you just integrate up the mu dt, and you can calculate the entropy as a function of n. Okay, this is mu taken from multiple temperatures. They calculate delta mu over delta t. They get s of n, and this is what they find. Okay, so uh, the importance of this result you can see by comparing it with the free electron theory this is the filling of the moire cell the magic angle graphene if you start with zero electrons that's basically zero carried the magic angle graphene four corresponds to full filling of the moire cell because it's in invalid degeneracy and so from the from the free electron picture you get some increase in entropy between zero, which is no electrons, and four, where everything is filled. But that scale to the temperature. The interesting thing about this experiment is that the entropy here is significantly higher than the free electron. And then they can check that this goes away with magnetic like field. They find that there are basically three spins or isospins that combine spin and value. In and that was the exciting one. Okay. Yes. Is the magic mechanism just the ingredient for the anything inside? Sorry? The other two materials uh, in the system instead of the uh, magic mechanism. Of, so, you mean could you do the same kind of measurement or see the same effect? Uh, the measurement. Just the measurement. Absolutely. The measurement is completely agnostic to what. Uh, yeah. 
to what this orange thing is. You can do that measurement with whatever you want. I think seeing the homeromantic effect, which means free spins when they should otherwise be frozen out in a Fermi liquid, um, that, as far as I know, is fairly special. To that. Okay, so uh, and over time, let me just wrap up. I tried to show you that conventional thermodynamic measurements are very hard in 2D, not impossible, but very hard. The Maxwell relation provides you a useful technique for carrying this out in any 2D material. And so I showed you an approach in 0D and an approach in 2D. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah. So it seems like the in summary, the Maxwell relations give you uh, access to entropy or capacity via transport techniques uh, because it has relation to the, the, the chemical potential change. So when I go to long, small length scales in general, uh, do I have to worry about the voltage drop from the interface between the contacts and, and the, the 2D system I want to probe? And would that, would that have an associated entropy that I have to worry about? So, so you mean will the contacts have an associated? So that's a great question. So, so really the question comes down to what is the entropy you're actually measuring? And so the answer is it may sound flippant, but the answer is whatever your thermodynamic system is. And so what is the part? That is an elevated temperature in contact with the thermal resonance. And so, so, I mean, when, when we look at that common dot experiment, there, there it was maybe most, most clear what exactly is the entropy we're measuring. And the answer is you're measuring the entropy of the full system, quantum dot plus the lead that's at finite temperature, but you're measuring how that entropy changes in response to a local change on the quantum dot. And so that's why you could measure this single spin in the quantum. Even though the entropy you're measuring is of something big, including the contacts, you're measuring the entropy change as a response to a local change. Uh, so in the Maxwell solutions, so I have two parts of my question. First part of my question is in the Maxwell solution we are using, uh, what is the constant of the partial? What the constants of the uh, yeah, so well, see, I, I don't. So, I guess, uh, in this case, it will be. Um, you, I, don't, I don't remember them off the top of my head. So, there's a T, there's a prepper that you would normally get that's sort of irrelevant in these 2D systems that's coming from generous pressure. But it's true that here you have to hold a new constant, and here you'll have to hold any. I see. Okay. And uh, in the, those constants, how do you achieve them when you apply the heat? Or because they, they're coupling to the path and coupling to everything that's right in the quantum dot experiments. So in the quantum dot experiments, it's, uh, it's easier to achieve, or it's, it's uh, maybe clear how you, how you achieve them because there you're measuring the NDT. At fixed mu, and mu is indeed fixed by so the electrostatics of your model. So, so you're not so mu is mu is not changing. The only thing that's changing is and that's really mu in the reservoir. In the two D materials problem, you're measuring the mu dt at fixed n, and the reason n is fixed is because n is basically set by by capacitance. It's set essentially by by again by electrostatics. And it doesn't have an effect on the coupling with the current, for example, the current. So there is some fluctuation of the cup, like the current. The current is not exactly fixed, right? Yes, that's right. And also the temperature of your bath, like the system is in, is it it's not what, what, yeah, what's the temperature of your system that you're mentioning? So in in the 2D material. Example, the temperatures were high. 
it were many Kelvin up to tens of Kelvin. In the quantum value experiment, it was zillions. In both cases, the temperature is in equilibrium within some relatively large. And that's why the level separation, that's, that's, if the level separation is harder than the temperature scale, that's the idea. That if that is harder, the level separation is harder than the KVT, then we can assume that it's like in a relatively equilibrium state. I, yeah, I guess I would say the thing that has a finite temperature is present. The quantum dot itself does not. Which is it? Absolutely, the technique is skipped one D. I'm just wondering with single quantum dot, if you scale that to a, either a 1D or 2D array of potentially interacting quantum dots, like if you get Magnetic phase transitions under uh, single octet quantum. Band. Sorry. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so we're taking the approach in my group right now of scaling from zero D to zero D plus, where we just start coupling maybe one more quantum dot or maybe a lead or something like this. Um, Already it starts becoming tricky. Um, so if you imagine trying to make a, a, a large network of them and hold them in thermal equilibrium, that's a little bit of a challenge. If you go from 2D down, then you're you'll be using a different approach to measure them. Um, and then that's what I would be scared of. But I mean there's no reason it will work, it's just I think the details will be tricky. Components of the Ising model, what we think they are. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they can some theorists. <laughs> okay. Final question. Comment. Complaint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> Okay, we have a coffee break. Uh, we'll be back at 11 o'clock. Yeah, thank you.